Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 90, we're going to talk about power tubes. And I've got a special guest, so stay tuned for that. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Quality power tubes are critically important to good sound. Unfortunately, most of the modern power tubes available are poor copies of the originals. In this episode, we're going to take a quick look at real vintage power tubes and discuss some of the differences between the types. So, first off, there are three basic types of power tubes. Now there's more, but let's just focus on the three more common. So in the beginning, all we had were direct heated triodes. And with a direct heated triode, the cathode and heater are combined. We just have a simple input grid, or G1. That's where our audio signal goes on. And we have an anode or plate connection. Let's just look at a 300B. So this is a higher power direct heated triode. This is a modern version. This was made by Electro Harmonix. They're beautiful tubes. Notice it only has four pins. And notice the really interesting shape of the place. This is a wonderful tube in pure class A and it's got a decent amount of power. Moving on, we, we had beam powered tetrodes developed. Now before them we had simply tetrodes. Now tetrodes had some problems and as soon as the beam powered version of them was developed nobody made tetrodes after that except for probably some special applications. Let's just grab a tube and have a quick look at it. So this is the lovely 6P7S. This is the power tube that we use in the Yuri monoblock. It's basically a 6L6 with a top cap, which is the plate connection, right? Always, when you see a single uh, top plate connection, it's almost always going to be the high voltage or anode or plate connection, same thing. And they're beautifully made tubes. They're highly reliable, really rock solid. I've never had one fail in service. We, this is what we use in the uh, Yuri monoblock, and they are perfect for acoustic music. They're very clean, clear, with good drive, and I just love this tube. I mean, it's just, it was a great find, and it's, it's one of the main reasons why the URI sounds so good. Let's just look at the, the schematic for it. So, just like the, the direct heated triode, we have a plate connection. Now, there are indirectly heated triodes. In fact, the the vast majority of triodes today are indirectly heated and all that is is the cathode is independent electrically from the heater elements or filaments that's all it is need more pins of course and um, by separating the cathode and the filament you electric when you separate them electrically you reduce the potential for noise substantially now, of course, the filament or heater is still producing a lot of heat, right? Because that's what gets the electrons moving off of the cathode. And they're, of course, attracted to the high voltage on the plate. So, what are the differences here? Well, first of all, a beam-powered tetrode physically has a plate that's shaped to focus the electrons. So it's not some kind of a nozzle shooting electrons. It's actually the physical structure. So let's just grab the tube again and have a peek. Have a look closely at how the plate is formed. You see how it's got a specific shape to it? They're all like that. And that is typically connected internally to the cathode but it may be an external connection. It just depends on the type of tube. It's the same thing. Um, it's just one more wiring job to be done outside if it's not internally connected. G1 or the input grid is the same as our DHT, but we've added something called G2, the screen grid. 
And all that does is help keep stray electrons that get bounced off the plate or are wandering around aimlessly <laughs> um, from going back on to G1, the input grid, because we don't want any excess electrons other than the audio signal getting on to here and messing things up. And of course the reason for that is we mostly control the operating point of a tube from the input grid, right? Okay. Now, moving on, we've got pentodes. Let me just grab one. I've got a very early pentode. This, or a very early EL34 would be a better way of saying it. This is a metal-based uh, Phillips tube. And you might say, well, this looks a lot like the Mullard XF series, and it does. And of course, Phillips with, with Mullard invented the EL34. And this is one of the first ones. They're very expensive. They're quite rare. Um, and let's just take a look at it. You can see how it looks like the plate structure is a bit formed, doesn't it? Now, the technology of these, of the beam powered tetrodes, the pentodes, they do some crossing over. So they are very similar electrically and their structure is very similar. There are just some subtle differences in how they're connected up electrically. The big differences are how the technol differences in electron technology affect the sound. That's really what I want to get to talking about today. So we're going to zoom through this. So here again we have an indirectly heated cathode. We've got the input grid 1. We've got screen grid 2. The addition of what's called the suppressor grid, or G3, is the big difference. That's typically internally tied to the cathode. And this is yet another refinement on controlling the flow of electrons. That's all it is. And these grid wires are literally wires that wind around um, do we have an opening on this one? No, I don't. Um, I don't actually have... Oh, maybe I do. Hang on. I've got a, a Soviet-era 6L6. This is a modern one with a wafer base. Can you see, if you look right through the holes with the right light, there you go. You see the, the, wind, the wire wound around? Well, that's a grid wire. So, and probably what makes a pentode so difficult to manufacture properly is that you've got three wires they all have to be wound around each other uh, among each other with each other it just depends on the tube the design how they're made so those wires all have to have a specific diameter a spacing otherwise the tube just doesn't work properly in fact a lot of problems that happen with vacuum tubes when they get noisy is with the input grids or one of the grids. Something has happened, maybe the tube was dropped, maybe it was overpowered, maybe it got an electrical shock somehow in circuit. Once the grid is messed up, the tube is normally garbage. There's no way to fix it, right? Because it's in a vacuum, so we can't get in there. And it's done to a very high spec. Okay, so what are the differences in sound? That's really what we wanted to get to. Well, a direct heated triode in pure class A is heaven. It's a very clean, immediate, clear sounding tube. Now, why don't we just have all of our equipment run with direct heated triodes? Well, because they, they will have an output of one to maybe seven or eight watts. The 300B I just showed you, you can get seven or eight watts, I think, out of it in pure class A. You can have a couple of them together in parallel and double that, but then that causes other problems. So, the newer technology basically gets us more power. That's what these have done for us. And um, they give us lower noise because when you have a direct heated tube, the cathode and the heaters or filaments are one and the same and they can bring noise onto the tube. When you isolate the cathode and the heaters or filaments electrically, that right away makes for a lower noise tube. 
Now, between a beam-powered tetrode and a pentode, there are differences in sound. The beam-powered tetrodes, by and large, tend to have a, a good drive, good bass, great clarity, lots of power. And pentodes tend to have a warmer sound um, and are better suited for acoustic music. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule. There's a KT-77 invented by Sylvania, and it's essentially a plug-in EL-34, but EL-34s are pentodes, right? Well, the KT-77 is a beam-powered tetrode. So, it was Sylvania's way of having an EL-34 equivalent to sell without having to buy from Phillips Mullard. And, um, you know, it created an entire new class of tubes. And the technology of these tubes gets mixed and matched depending on what, you know, the goal of the designers are and what the needs of the manufacturers, the equipment manufacturers, did a lot of driving of technology. They would ask for a certain type of tube. So that gives you a sort of an overview of the differences of these tubes. And it's something I wanted to talk about for a long time. And I often talk to customers about, you know, if they're looking for a certain sound in a power tube, I will, I will look at the tubes from that point of view. I don't look at it from the point of view of electrically. I look from the point of view of how do they actually sound in circuit, in service, in an amp. Okay, so what's been happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, Charles finished the first CNC production run of Kit Amp, Top Plates. And talking about Charles, here he is. Here I am. Wow. Let's just back out a little bit here. Yeah. Well, welcome. So, uh, what brings you here? Well, uh, I finally decided to go in full time with the business and uh, help. I'm sorry, I'm completely. You, you're gonna you're gonna help move us forward. Yeah, yeah, help move us forward. Uh, we have finally the first production run of plates done, and I'm gonna help start getting them out the door and into the store. Well, let's let's take a look at let's just clear the decks here and get this mm -hmm. off. So here is one of the first production runs of the Universal six or twelve SN seven preamp plates. Wow! And as you can see, they've come out pretty nice. It still needs a little bit of extra finishing work. Let's just take a look, get it on camera so that people can see. Now this is raw off the CNC machine, right? Yeah, raw off the CNC machine. So there's a little nubbins here. A little bit of a nub there and we still have to do some chamfering and of course put that nice brushed finish on the plates. That's right. So this is this is with all the little scratches that you get from manufacturing. In fact some of the scratches arrive from the supplier, right? Yeah, most of them do. Yeah, so but with the brush finish uh, it doesn't take actually that much of the surface off but I, I put apply the brush finish this way uh, from back to front until every scratch is off and uniform. Mm -hmm. So it's in a way it's a perfect kind of a finish and I, I kind of like it. It gives a sort of um, a medium matte surface finish and it hides scratches. Aluminum, aluminum is beautiful with a nice coating of hard wax. It machines beautifully. Well, you had <laughs> it took a while with the, getting the CNC to machine beautifully, right? Well, I don't think that was the material's fault. It, it was uh, a bit of a learning experience for me, but I think I have it all figured out now, and uh, we yeah. have quite a few plates ready to go. Yeah, it really looks like you do have it all figured out. So what we're going to do moving forward is we're going to put the hand finishing touches onto the first runs of plates. We have, you ran plates for all three uh, production kit amps, right? All three of our production kit amps and some that we have yet to announce and release. Right, so we've got prototype plates to work with. So we're going to go through the kit amps one at a time. We have the, the parts are in stock, so we can we can put in the store at least 10, 10 kit amps for each type. And, and for an amp like the Uri, I think we can put 20 in, so uh, 10, 10 pairs, of course, of monoblocks. Um, but we'll announce each Friday as the production uh, kits are available. And all we really have to do, the big job now, is to 
is to do the hand cleanup of the production um, of the CNC plates. I, I really, you did a great job. I mean, um, to think that a computer did did this work, and we've been checking them, and they are really accurate. They're pretty much bang on. There's a small amount of variance, but we're talking fractions of a millimeter in most cases. Fractions of a millimeter, okay. Uh, well, that's, I mean, with the design of a, of a kit top plate, we have to build in um, a slot factor, right? Of course, yeah. So that people can fit things and not struggle with fit. There's no reason to have things down to the tiniest tolerance because then that just makes for problems. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for doing this and I'm, you know, I needed your help. I mean, I, for months now, I've been working at basically my limit and um, maybe some people have said past my limit. Uh, and we're going to, uh, you know, hopefully do great things together. Well, I'm hoping I can pick up some of the slack and get these kits in the store soon, so keep your eyes open for them. Well, okay, great. Okay, well, thanks for dropping in, Charles. I'll we'll get that out of here then. Okay, well, let's take a quick look and see what came in this week. There's a couple of things I want to show you. Now, when I first... This is a switch mode power supply, or power brick, uh, people typically call them. This is what you know, is used to power up all kinds of things, including laptops. People use it for under-counter lighting. And basically it takes the household mains, the AC, and turns it into DC. Now, when I first developed my preamp kits, my started with a prototype, of course, I wanted to have DC on the filaments, which means I, I needed a separate power supply. So I went to the switch mode power supplies and I needed a 6.3 and a 12.6. Well, I found a 12 volt, which is close enough for the 12.6 filaments. And the closest I could find a 6.3 at the time was 7 volts, which meant we really needed a little dropping resistor. There's only half an ohm for the kits, but, you know, it's just one more thing. And the 7 volt uh, switch modes weren't cheap. So... Recently, I just got lucky. I was searching for some, I'm always looking for electronic parts for various things. And I found six volt, high powered, five amp um, uh, switch mode power supplies. And these will become our new standard, which will mean six volt is, is perfect for a 6.3 volt filament. Um, in fact, I remember now I was looking for a higher current capable six, six volt switch mode. And these had come on the market since I had last looked. So these are just absolutely perfect. And I'm just so happy to find them. And they're nice and quiet. They work just great. So they're in the store now. And as the production kits come out and we talk about them, they'll, they'll be designed to be using the 6-volt uh, filament supply instead of the 7. Okay, now Charles found a whole bunch of these lovely 12BH7, some of them new in the sleeve. Uh, we have views, we have new old stock, we have quite a few Sylvania new old stock. They're not yet in the store, but they will be soon. And let me see if I can get one out. Hang on a second, I've got to find a tool here. Just snap that open. There we go. Now the 12BH7 is a tube we'll probably feature in a future tube lab. It looks like a really tall version of the 12AU7, doesn't it? And that is very much what it is. I haven't looked at it very closely, but people are using this as a near substitute or close substitute for the 12AU7 and are loving it. So um, we're we're going to have quite a few of these new old stock new in the box in the store and it's going to take a few days. We're actually on our national holiday today and as soon as this video is uploaded, I'm off. <laughs> it's not off and I take a half a day off, but I'll be off for the rest of Friday and we'll be back. At, I, I always work on Saturday, so I'll be back at work tomorrow. Uh, and if you stayed this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if you order $150 or more 
after discount the shipping's on me folks stay safe everyone have fun this is jim from valsenmore signing off cheers everyone